Okay. Welcome, dear visitors, to the 13th Monday night stream from ACC Gallery Weimar, which is also, also the first one in English. And warm welcome to all listeners who have tuned in via Bauhaus FM. Small footnote, we will add a German summary and useful links under this video, so it's worth checking out again and spreading the link. Experimental radio is our topic today, the headline. The reason for this broadcast is the first radio art residency in Weimar, an international scholarship program for artistic pra practice on radio. For a few days, it has been known which non-German speaking artist will come to Weimar for three months artistic residency. 472 applications from all over the world were received, but only one was able to make the race. Mazimba Huati, who was born in Harare, Zimbabwe in 1982, is the first scholarship holder of the first radio art residency in Weimar. He joins us today, tonight, from Vienna, where he currently lives and works as an artist. Hello to Vienna. Welcome, dear Masimba Huati. He will live and work in Weimar from April to June 2021, this year, and then, that's the plan, parallel to his residency, he will also be here, live at the ACC, and hopefully in front of a real audience. The Radio Art Residency is a joint project of Goethe Institut, Experimental Radio of the Bauhaus University Weimar, in cooperation with Uni University of Music Franz Liszt Weimar, Deutschlandfunk Kultur, and uh, the Landesmedienanstalt Thuringian State Media Authority. The Eigenheim Gallery Weimar, Berlin, and we, the ACC Gallery Weimar, are involved as project partners for exhibition and events lectures, performances, accompanying this residency. But before we switch to Vienna, we find out what radio can do beyond broadcasting information and entertainment. That is the research and study field of experimental radio at Bauhaus University Weimar, a course that is unique in Europe and is under the direction of Professor Nathalie Singer. In conversation with her colleague Laura Dang, she gives us an insight into the complex laborat laboratory for radiophonic sound art. I would like to briefly intro introduce both of them in a few words. Professor Nathalie Singer has held the chair of experimental radio at the Bauhaus University Weimar since 2007. She studied music, communication and psychology in Berlin and Paris since 1995. She has worked as a radio play and feature writer, composer, director and pro producer for radio, such as Sender Freies Berlin, Deutschland Radio Kultur, Bayerischer Rundfunk, Westdeutscher Rundfunk and Radio France. She composed radio plays, stage and film music and published on the subject of elect electroacoustic music and sound art. In 2005, she received the radio journal Rundfunk Prize for developing uh, the new short radio play format Wurfsendung, which, by the way, I like very much. She, uh, the project was taken over by BBC and Radio Denmark and presented at various nation, national and international festivals. So, one of the main concerns of her work is artistic communication of new ideas with the help of various media and the building of bridges between foreign cultures and between art and science. Laura Ang Tu Dang was born in 1994 in Mülheim an der Ruhr as a child of two both people. She grew up bilingual, Vietnamese German. She is a radio artist and feature author and completed her master's degree in media art and media design at the chair of experimental radio at the Bauhaus University Weimar. Before that, she studied applied musicology and music education in Eichstätt. Thematically, she deals with the stories of the Vietnamese diaspora in Germany and would like to contribute to making them more visible. 
I would like to briefly introduce you to another protagonist of this evening, Lefteris Chrysalis. Since the start of our live streams in 2020, he has become an indispensable supporter for all technical questions and, so far, behind the camera and without a mic microphone. Even today, he will oversee the technology, but for the first time in front of the camera and with microphone, since he is also the project coordinator of the Radio Art Residency. Lefteri studied art history and theory at the Athens School of Fine Arts and completed his master's degree in media art and design at Bauhaus School, Bauhaus University, Weimar, on the chairs of experimental radio and studio of electroacoustic music. His focus is on experimental radio formats and electroacoustic musical elements, and for his master thesis, he conducted a research and work on the topic of politics of listening, soundscapes from Ramallah, Palestine. But now I will hand over to Professor Nathalie Singer, who is connected to us from Berlin, and to her colleague Laura Dang, who is here with us in the gallery, but who for well-known and technical reasons sits in the separate room. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you for the warm welcome and introduction, Ulrike. And uh, we would also like to say hello to our dear listeners on Radio Lotte and Bauhaus FM in Weimar. You can follow the stream live on YouTube with RCC Gallery, but also um, listen on the radio. Good evening, Natalie. Hello, and also from my side, hello to our listeners, and thank you, Ulrike, for the nice welcoming and introduction. <laughs> Um, Laura, of <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Natalie. To start off, I would like to ask you, um, speaking about radio and what's possible beyond this medium from the well-known, can you tell us what radio art is and how you define radio art and what it includes? Well, radio art, to say it in a very simple way, is when artists use the medium of radio, which is existing about 100 years around now. I mean, every year we are celebrating another 100 years of radio <laughs> start and discovery since four years. But around 100 years, we have this new media and like there is video art and uh, we, we have uh, artists who from the beginning on were dealing with this medium radio using the technology of the radio and the impact and the transmission situation for artistical praxis. And I think all this can be called radio art. Uh, it can be a pre-recorded collage or work, but it can also be a, a, an installation. It can be a performance. Uh, it, it is a very big field. And it also very big because as since radio is existing as well, uh, writers used it as an expression of art, uh, the theater, but also the composers and also a journalist expanded the documentary to soundscapes <laughs> and to forms of artistical praxis. So you have a really wide spectrum uh, what is containing in radio art, which is which has a lot of undertitles. Huh? <laughs> you, you have a lot of under definition of radio art, like radio drama, like radio installation, you have cinema for the ears, there are a lot of expressions for what radio art is. But to make it simple, it's when artists use the medium for their practice. <laughs> That's a very nice way to describe it. So there are ways of possibilities to express yes. yourself with the medium radio, which also will be possible for the artists in residence here in Weimar. Um, and Ulrike said that you are the head of the chair of experimental radio. Since when is it possible to actually study experimental radio in Weimar and how did it came into existence? Yeah, well, actually, uh, I was not the first one. I was the first full professorship, like the kind of fixed professorship who got this, uh, this chair. But before me, there was like six or seven years before me or nine, even there were there were um, assistant professor or, or uh, yeah, uh, they were uh, Ralf Hohmann and they started already to build up Bauhaus FM, this radio you know very good and we are just broadcasting today uh, at the first university radio 
uh, channel. <laughs> so this was something which happened before. And actually, it happened out of the idea, I think, of Lorenz Engel, a professor who is still here, to create experimental chairs for medias so that we question what this media radio or there was another chair called experimental television <laughs> so there was uh, what what are the the changings of this media due to digitalization due to conversion of media due to the change of the times so it's a very unconventional chair and unique in the in Europe and the world, I would think. Uh, of course, there are a lot of other places dealing with sound and sound art or electroacoustic music, but to really uh, focus totally on radio art, I think we are quite unique here. Um, yeah, it was quite a unique program. I also went through um, talking about uh, ways of how to adapt in the current times. Um, so we're all facing the pandemic right now. And where has the teaching shifted to mainly during the pandemic? Did you find digital solutions to continue it? And how did you deal with that? Well, yeah, at the beginning, I have to say I was vice president uh, three years of, of teaching. <laughs> and uh, we talked a lot about digitalization. And I was a little bit resisting, I have to admit, <laughs> for before the pandemic, because I said that the arts and the handcraft and the listening together, it can only happen in person with the studio, with the, with the equipment. And we cannot do this online. And I was a little bit always... Uh, critical. Well, then the shift came, we had to learn it. I remember that Christiane Foss, a philosophy uh, professor and me, we were completely nervous, a student educating us how to use all these digital tools and things. And we had feedbacks and loops and we were laughing like hell and we were a little bit nervous. And then actually, I have to say now it's the third semester or one year already that we do it. I discovered that it has also a lot of advantages. It has a lot of beautiful things also. And, um, uh, and of course, there's a lot of things we can do only in the studios and we can really realize only, especially all the listening with good qualities together and the resonance, which happens when people are together listening or together in a space or some exercises with the voice or the body, which has to do with, with human resonance phenomenon, they don't work in the online. But I made a lot of listening practices online and it worked quite well. I also sent the people out coming back with exercises. And then we did also exercises in front of the camera with moving, with listening. Uh, I, I, was, I was really astonished how much we can do. And you have this amazing uh, rooms. You can uh, throw people in and make them make, <laughs> share and have exercises. So that actually there's a lot of intimacy happening also in online. And sometimes the impression, uh, I shared this also with my uh, assistants and my uh, colleagues. Sometimes the people are more concentrated. <laughs> When they are online. It is a form, they are better prepared, the students, and, and concentrate. Maybe also because they are not allowed to go to parties or to, <laughs> to go out late or to, to make any other things. So this is more maybe the reason. Maybe it's not the online. Yeah? I cannot tell you. But So I have to say that I saw a lot of advantages, but still I think we need to come together again. <laughs> Hopefully it will be possible to come together at least in summer in a way. Yes. Um, do you think, um, speaking about these changes also, and um, the changes of listening that you mentioned before, that you don't listen together in a room anymore, but now you listen online or you give the people tasks to go outside and listen. Um, do you have the feeling that uh, the listening changed during the pandemic also from other people or that um, more and more people are making podcasts nowadays and also listen differently and pay attention to different mediums for another time? Yeah, so first I think that the listening in, in the online praxis is a different listening than the listening in a space with the body and, 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 and with the human in front of you and with others around of you. So the listening praxis of online and digital is already different. This is one thing. The other thing is that the fact that the cultural world has been stopped completely and a lot of people uh, use the radio and use the podcast and, and the internet platforms and the audio as a possibility to 
um, to, to still work, to still show the thing, there was a huge boom of podcast and radio, as a, also because it's a cheap medium and it's crossing barriers without transmitting virus or anything. <laughs> you don't need to take an airplane to, to, to send a soundscape or another sound somewhere else. This is all technology uh, technique of the radiophony, uh, but it got very useful in Corona time. So there's a huge boom of podcasts and radio. Um, mm, I cannot say now of how it will be if the, the 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 life normalizes and everything goes back to presence. If it will stay as a new cultural technique, if people do this, will have discovered a new. Uh, opportunity in listening or if it will go back to 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 the old and maybe we will have to reinforce this by other workshops and classes which show the power of listening as a cultural technique but maybe people will have already experiences and memories about this in another way this i'm sure for it's really exciting to see also how people are more willing to pay attention to longer formats like podcasts um, we listen to before we had like radio features and radio plays, but also podcasts um, prepare the content in another way for the listeners and it's easy and um, more accessible for people also to do it by themselves. Um, speaking about listening, another person that deals with the politics of listening was um, Lefteris Cruzales in his um, thesis and I would like to welcome him now also here to join us in the talk as uh, the coordinator of the Radio Art Residency. Hello, Love Terrace. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Perfect. <laughs> Hi, so, thank you, Laura. The Department of Experimentalist Radio and um, you are initiating a collaboration right now, a Radio Art Residence. Um, what is the Radio Art Residence that Ulrika already mentioned and also she mentioned the project partners in the beginning? I think maybe uh, Natalie can give us an, how it started, a better an idea, and then maybe you can say what it is right now. Well, actually, it, it's already existing. Since it was existing already in Halle in, uh, uh, with Radio Korax, uh, uh, also radio station in Halle. Uh, three years, they already started with six different artists and um, the, the program was, was ending in Halle because of different financial reasons and Goethe Institute was looking for a new place uh, to, to follow it but maybe also to change it a little bit in the format and as I am in the Beirat uh, of the Goethe Institute, we know each other, we do a lot of projects, they ask us where and I think they were interested also to keep it in, in the formal East German uh, countries. And well, as we just said, the radio art is quite unique in Weimar uh, as, as a focus. So we took, we brought it here and yeah, we expanded it with a lot of collaboration partner or for, for first Deutschland Funk Kultur, uh, one of the biggest broadcaster in Germany with the Abteilung for Klangkunst led by Markus Gammel, who also immediately joined us uh, to support this new radio art residency. And of course, we are doing it together with the Musikhochschule Franz Liszt. Uh, we have this sound art and sound design uh, cooperation already since long time with the electroacoustic studio in uh, Weimar from the Hochschule of Musik, the Music Academy, Franz Liszt. And we are about uh, to make it even bigger with a new professorship. So we will be a very strong department of sound art and sound design. And this residency was will be also uh, helping to make this international, to make the exchange internationally uh, bigger. And we will collaborate, of course, with all the other programs, uh, international programs and study programs. So it will have another way. And maybe, yeah, uh, we find it a lot of other collaboration partner, but Lefteris maybe wants to say more about all this. And also he was the one who went really the only one who know all the 470 <laughs> entries we got. This was totally astonishing. <laughs> Nobody expected so many. It was really wow. And uh, yeah, so maybe I give yeah. to Lev Terrace, who is the only one who knew every entry. <laughs> uh, thank <laughs> you, Natalie. I'm happy that we could find Lev Terrace to take care uh, now of the Radio Art Residency in this program. <laughs> 
Thank you, thank you. And uh, yeah, so as Natalie said, it was started by Geta Institute and the, the Bauhaus self in Weimar for this. And also Deutschlandfunk Kultur joined us and Eigenheim ga uh, Gallery uh, providing the exhibition space uh, for a month at the end of the three months uh, radio art residency period. And of course, as it's a gallery that we are also right now here. And in this process, we made the application. And as Natalie already said, we received more than 472 applications that showed a big interest of people in the radio art internationally from, the, uh, from all the continents. Uh, different approaches and different applications. We had applications for uh, sound installations, to podcasts and from research and uh, working with archival material to radio plays in Hairsville. So it was a quite diverse and uh, huge input. And it was a hard decision also, but uh, we are quite happy with Masim Bahwati that he will join us uh, at the beginning of April. And the plan of it is twice per year, a three month period. First from uh, April until June, and the second from the 15th of September until the 15th of December, where an invited artist can come here, research, work, uh, make an exhibition, an artist talk, and at the end also a broadcast on Deutschland von Kultur. Uh, so, this was the first kind of description of the residency. Thank you a lot. And uh, can you give us just a short insight on how the selection process worked? For this, I would like to thank personally all of the people in the jury. It was uh, like Professor Natalie Zinker, Mark Andres Machtel, and Georg Mills from uh, Goethe Institute, Konstantin Bayer and uh, Bianca Voigt from Eigenheim Gallery, and uh, Markus Gammel from Deutschland von Kultur, the Klangkunst. Uh, so the selection uh, was really difficult, but at the end, uh, the jury, I went through all the applications, the 472. And uh, they continues like uh, the jury read them with my comments, and uh, we all of us we had to vote and talk and uh, spend a lot of time uh, through the applications. And at the end, we had the interviews with the ten artists that we thought that they were the most strong applications, with uh, the most interesting ones, and then we came up with the result. So speaking of the result. And he got already also introduced, uh, Mazumba Huaiti uh, is the artist in residence, the first artist in residence for the period of April and June uh, until June 2021 here in Weimar. And I would like to welcome him also to join us now into the talk. Um, maybe a short introduction again <laughs> for the listeners that just switched on the radio. Uh, Mazumba Huaiti works across sculpture, video, performance and sound. He holds an MFA from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and is a PhD in art practice candidate at the Academy of Fine Art in Vienna, where he's also being right now. And I would like to warmly welcome you um, to our round. Really happy to have thank you, you here. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, when Lefteris was talking about the process and how many people applied, I'm, I'm getting more nervous. <laughs> 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 Hi. Hey, Natalie, how are you? Hi, Masimba. Very nice to see you again. It's good. In a it's more good to relaxed be here. atmosphere than in a jury. Yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I'm uh, very excited to be part of this uh, program. Yeah, very, very nice that you, you can make it and that it works out. <laughs> Right. Uh, thank you, everyone. And also, Masipa, since you are here now with us, and it's the first time that you are even digitally, but you are in Weimar, let's mm -hmm. see. Uh, I would like you to ask you to tell us a little bit about you as an artist and about mm -hmm. your artistic work and your approach and how right. you came up into working with sound, because I'm right. an artist as a multidisciplinary artist. Right, right. So I uh, started out as a ceramic artist and a painter and uh, been practicing for many years in uh, Zimbabwe. Um, so I've always had this interest in sound, but never got the structures and the encouragement to exploit. Uh, but when I look back at my work, uh, which is more sculptural than anything, I can see a little bit uh, of sound and performance coming in. 
uh, it's only about three years ago where I got the confidence to really explore sound as a medium. And also, not only as a medium, but also as a way of thinking. And um, so many things that started to open up uh, in that intersection whereby I make sculptures and I'm thinking of sound. And I'm thinking of how to activate these sculptures and what sound they could make. Uh, but also just thinking about uh, what sound can be, you know, in an ex expanded definition. Uh, like what, what does inaudible sound do? You know, uh, what is the vibration? How do you, how do you uh, <clears throat> interact with vibration? And how do you talk about sound that you don't hear, you know? And uh, what is the place of that sound? So I just became fascinated with these questions. And then um, last year, I bumped into some very interesting materials, which were uh, archives, uh, sound archives from wartime radio during the liberation struggle uh, in Zimbabwe, which, was, uh, uh, which brought the independence. So during this uh, struggle, you had uh, uh, radio stations we, we were broadcasting from the neighboring countries because they were not allowed to broadcast. So these were guerrilla radio stations and they would broadcast into the country. So I just got so fascinated listening to some of those archives and uh, just discovering how much radio uh, played an important role in uh, recruiting people for war, but also in just radicalizing people. Uh, and there's also this communal aspect that people would listen to radio in a certain way. It's different from now that you're on your phone or on your iPod, but it was a communal thing. It was a ritual. So we are talking about listening rituals where people would actually sometimes dress up to come to listen to a broadcast at a certain time. And they would gather around this radio piece. And I remember growing up, um, these radios were decorated or embellished with something. Uh, my mom used to make doilies, she would crochet, and she would make a little crochet for the radio and put it on top of the radio. <laughs> so even um, later when we grew up, you would see, uh, people walking with big stereos on their shoulders, you know, young people, but still there was an embellishment there. There was a crochet or something, or if not a crochet, somebody would write something. So we are talking about an object, but we are talking about an aesthetic of an object, but also, you know, how does this radio perform itself on people? You know, thinking of how many schools during the liberation struggle who listened to the radio and you had whole schools of young people who were like in a trance just because they listened to a broadcast. And then they would cross the border to go and fight to liberate their country. So all these narratives are very, very intriguing for me. So when I discovered this residence, I said, oh, wow, this is a place where I could experiment with these ideas. So. This is super exciting to be here. <laughs> I would have a question immediately because it's fascinating. Yes. And I did a big exhibition about archives, radio art uh -huh. archives, in uh, how to bring it in exhibition space. But we realized that it's extremely difficult to get broadcasts and archives of pirate radios because mm -hmm. normally they don't they don't have archives. <laughs> right, they don't right, record right. what they do because it's so dangerous and it has to be quick and it's politically mm -hmm. forbidden. So right. how, how could you, how, how did these archives happen and how could you find them or how can it be that they are still existing? So that's a very good question. Um, so I've been gathering some of this material uh, slowly. And as you say, these were guerrilla broadcasts. It's not easy to get them. Uh, but I'll tell you that the archives exist. They are there in Zimbabwe. There are people with personal archives. But getting to talk to them and convincing them 
to give you access to that archive is a totally different thing altogether. So I've been uh, working with a few people that I know who have been helping me to get some of these. And these are not complete like uh, documentation. Uh, these are snippets, but you could put them together, you know, and you could get an idea of what was happening uh, at that time. Uh, and I, I also think that it's not only the message that is important in there, but just even the white noise itself is part of the whole uh, uh, constitution of what made this thing uh, so powerful. So it's a, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's, they are not easy to get, but I think I'm progressively beginning to access more and more of this material as I talk to people and negotiate with people. Um, thank you uh, for the answer. I also have a, a short question because you mentioned that this is something that I saw also sometimes the idea of putting this crochet on the radio and treat the radio device yeah. with a certain way yes. of aesthetics and yes. importance. Uh, also, I saw that in your artistic practice, uh, you are transforming and uh, you are using uh, instruments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to ask you how you could see, like, uh, connected this idea of taking old instruments and transforming them with the idea also of like the the materiality of the radio, the materiality of the instrument, and the materiality right. of all this. Uh, right, right, right. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so, in the residency, my plan is to use some of these uh, uh, archives, uh, archival material. Uh, as source material uh, to respond to it, but, but to use the actual material itself and think of how I can mediate it or affect it in a certain way. And uh, for this, I want to have uh, points or places where this sound is coming from. And I think the sculpture for me or the instruments that I will make, they will host that sound and interact with that sound. So I'm thinking of creating some kind of uh, recitals or, or, or orchestras where you have these instruments which are both hosting and interpreting uh, this archival material, this important archival material. Uh, and then you know, making some kind of uh, performance with them and hopefully with some people. I, I'm not sure what COVID is going to be looking like, but uh, I think it would be great to get some people together, <laughs> you know, and uh, have uh, some performance. And also, you know, that community aspect around radio, I think that is what made radio so powerful in uh, back in the days in Zimbabwe. So I think it would be great to have that. Uh, communal aspect is yes, somehow involved. Yeah, I like this uh, a lot, what you said about the uh, community and the listening aspect in community. And it, it would be something also when you are there and when we meet or maybe in the next RCC gallery talk or meeting to right. focus a little bit on maybe also different listening practices mm. uh, you have maybe in Zimbabwe and we have here or do are do there are differences or not and 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 how is it mm. also connected to the music listening practice we have right. in different countries and right um and radio yeah how is radio perceived it's very interesting to know right. more about it right 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 <laughs> Uh, Masimba, also you sent us some video files, right? Oh yes, for sure. From your uh, work, uh, do you have in mind? Would you like to play one of them uh, as a small uh, break, and also to see part of your work, and then we can come back for the discussion? Yeah, if it's uh, possible, I would ask. Uh, I'm not sure about my internet connection, uh, I so I, I would ask you to play. Thank you, thank you very but much. Which one of you, the two you prefer? Uh, I think let's play the Mbende Jerusalem. And, and maybe if we have time, I might talk a little bit about it. Perfect, perfect. Thank you.
can you tell us also for the listeners that are not seeing us but just listening to us and describe what we just saw and heard? All right, all right. Thank you, Lefters. Uh, so this uh, piece uh, of work is called Mbende Jerusalem Techno. And uh, it's a, a project that I worked on in collaboration with uh, a few friends of mine in Detroit, Michigan. So I was exploring uh, two particular dances that uh, one is from Zimbabwe. Uh, the name of that dance is called Mbende Jerusalem. It's a dance that has a history of uh, being used in warfare in uh, we had two, two uh, wars in Zimbabwe, the first Chimurenga and the second Chimurenga. So this dance was part of those struggles. And uh, the second dance is a dance called JIT. It, is, uh, it was developed in Detroit in the late seventies. And uh, these friends of mine are professional JIT dancers. That's what they do for a living. So what I did is I, created a choreography that combined the two dances. So what you see is a hybrid of the two dances. And uh, the reason why these two dances were important to me is they were all used as forms of resistance or forms of embodied resistance. Uh, but something happened when we were rehearsing. I noticed that there was the sound that was created by the feet of the dancers, the friction between the ground uh, and the feet of the dancers. And this is something that I had never seen before, uh, never heard before, because when you play, when, when these dances are performed, there's music. So the music would cover those, that sound. So you don't hear that sound. So I took away the music. And what you hear is the breathing of the dancers. You hear their clothes, you hear the friction. So that hidden sound that is in between you know, that liminal space where the sound is existing, to me is, I, I think that's a brilliant picture of how people can resist in ways that are not obvious and how people can carry this sound within them that if you are not paying attention and not listening well, it will uh, evade you. So this is what you had. It's a long performance. It's got other parts, but I think this, part that we saw uh, is a kind of a summary of the whole uh, project. We can ask the listener how they perceive the bodies <laughs> <laughs> and the dance by listening to the sound. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Embodiment of dance in uh -huh. radio. Uh, I like that. But I found really so interesting after you explained it also to us and made it a little bit uh, easier. Like because you talked about this, the non-visible, and that at the beginning you you were not able to hear, so it was the unheard. And I find also this connection with like in your application, for example, I remember that you mentioned and you quoted Brandon Labelle. Yes. Uh, about uh, the the darkness and the unheard. And if you would like, and if you have, you have the time, I, I would like to ask you also, like considering like Radon Labelle's writings about listening or what, mm -hmm. what's the influence or your connection, the connection to your work? Right. So I discovered uh, Brandon Labelle's work uh, through a friend and uh, a lot of it made sense to me because these were things that I, I saw and I knew at the back of my mind, but I did not have the words for them. Um, for instance, he talks about the unheard, you know, uh, but he also makes this uh, analogy between social political uh, situations and sound, where you have a situation whereby other sounds are heard and other sounds are not heard, you know. But what does that mean in a society where other people? might not be visible it doesn't it doesn't mean that they are not present they are just not heard and not visible and how do you how do you deal with such a situation so i think uh, one of the fascinating things about brandon labelle is the way that he he looks at sound as a philosophy as thinking even if you think about uh he, he 
say something about the migratory nature of sound or the itinerant, whereby you have a sound that is always moving from the source and it refuses to be domesticated. And I, I found that fascinating because I, I always think in terms of resistance, like how do people resist, you know? And uh, growing up in Zimbabwe under an authoritarian government, uh, you begin to see how people move like sound sometimes, you know, and sometimes how they uh, negotiate themselves around power um, and how they deal with power. And sometimes maybe not to change it, but to modify it, you know, just the way that sound moves with things, in things and around things. So it made a lot of sense to begin to find some language, you know, uh, to put to some of the things that I was observing even in my community. And uh, I think there's a lot to be said about uh, the way that sound exists and uh, the way, the way uh, about listening practices uh, as compared to power politics or to social political thing. I think there's a lot, there's a, a rich discussion there. And I think Brandon Label for me opens up that discussion. And uh, yeah, I, I look forward to talking to some people about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think yeah. for discussions about listening also with yeah, Professor yeah. Zinger and the rest, rest yes, people yes. here, you can. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, we had Brendan uh, last semester in a Oh, race. wow. So wow. we have him in the archives, but we can invite him again. I mean, he is in Berlin and he's very close by, and I think he would wow. be very happy to, to join us for. Wow. Anyway, he wanted to come to Weimar one time. Maybe if the, the Corona is a little nicer to us and opens the possibility, we will use it to bring him. <laughs> Sounds good. Amazing. Cast about he talked a lot also about dreams and about the oh wow uh, the question if we if we listen to sound in dreams and how mm. how we perceive it and interesting mm. subject yeah um, yeah I find also really interesting in your work and I'm really looking forward to see how all this thing will be combined because of the, the, these inputs with the radio and the listening mm -hmm. uh, the, the rituals the unheard and uh, but also, you sent us another video, right? Mm -hmm. uh, would you like also to play it first and then you can talk about it? Yeah, if you uh, maybe uh, be so kind and play it and then... Yeah, I'll... that's of course. Of Thank course. you. Thank you. Perfect.
Yes, sorry for the no sound in the beginning. It was my mistake. That's why I played it twice. <laughs> all right, all right. Thank you, Lev Cheris. So I made that uh, a video in the process of making a sculpture. Uh, and then I just took part of the, an installation and started recording it. And uh, if you, I don't know if you saw it, but uh, what you have at the bottom of that sculpture is a, a roll of decommissioned banknotes. These are, this is actually money that was used, that was functional in Zimbabwe at some point, but uh, because of hyperinflation, it's no, it was decommissioned. It's no longer uh, functioning. And I think Zimbabwe had one of the uh, great biggest inflations uh, in the world. So the currency is non-existent and we use um, the US dollar right now. So I was using a lot of this uh, currency and just trying to think about that inflation and what it means. And also thinking about sound, you know, how, how does that sound? And then I discovered that as you play with the uh, software in video, you know, you get, uh, you could reverse it and you can get uh, white noise and some sounds are more amplified than others. And that figure that you see on the, on top of the banknotes is sort of like a signature way that I work, where I combine uh, African traditional aesthetics with uh, sometimes uh, maybe Western or Chinese or, or other aesthetics from other places. So the figure that you have, if you look uh, closely, resembles what is called Nkisi Konde, which is a power figure from West Africa, very powerful figure. Uh, there's a whole history of the Nkisi, it's like a, maybe an equivalent of a voodoo doll, right? Uh, but here you have a smurf that is taking that place. And uh, you have all kinds of things that are part of that. And uh, I, I play around a lot with the idea of what happens to cultures when they meet, you know, uh, what, how are they transformed? What remains, or what is changed? Uh, and how does that look like? You know, what is funny about that and what is not funny <laughs> about that. So uh, I think this is the way that I've always been with. I noticed that I have this tendency of just mashing these things together to create some kind of hybrid things. Sometimes they appear very funny and sometimes they are not funny at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is one of the uh, figures that you see there. Okay. Uh, and it was a stop motion video, right? Or if um, so it was an uh, ordinary video and then okay. I uh, played around with it in uh, Premiere, uh, you know, uh, yeah. using, using skills that I saw on YouTube, I go on YouTube and, <laughs> you know, and then edit the video, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, speaking about merging and hybridity, what role does language play in your work? Oh, thank you for that question. Uh, so right now, I, I am writing and thinking about uh, language a lot, especially the Shona language, which is uh, uh, my, my vernacular language. And in Shona language, it's so fascinating because it's a very sonic language. You know, uh, everything is centered around sound. And I got so fascinated about this, uh, the phonetics in Shona language, but not only the phonetics, but the way that everything always goes back to reference sound. And this, I'm using it as a window to explore uh, sonic thinking in Shona philosophy. Uh, I'll give you an example. So when somebody in Shona wants to ask about the amount of salt in food, they would say, can you hear the salt in the food? This is how, if you translate it to English, it's, it sounds like, can you hear it? Um, implying that the tongue, for some reason, 
is in a, a, a part of the body that can receive sonic information. Uh, the, another example is when uh, somebody is not feeling well and you are asking about their health, you ask them, how are you hearing? Urkunzo was saying, which means how are you hearing? Implying that the body is, a, uh, is, is like a big ear or something. So you find this everywhere, even the earth, even trees, you know, even rocks. There's always this sonic language that is used to describe things, even things that are not living, you know. So there is a, there is it's very interesting how I'm discovering that in Shona language, you, you begin to see the, the way that our ancestors were thinking about sound, the way that the ear was not the primary uh, organ of hearing, you know. The ear was one of them. The ear, yes, of course, the ear can hear, but many other things can hear. The head can hear, the foot can hear, the earth can hear, the trees can hear, you know, all those things. So it's helping me. So looking at the language, I, 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 I'm using this word, the um, acoustics of collision. I'm using this word because it, it's making sense. Because if you look at uh, instruments or tools in Shona, the, the names or the nouns for those tools uh, uh, perform the sound that they make. You know? So if I tell you a name of a tool, you can, you can immediately figure out what sound it makes because the name is performing the sound. You know, and I'm, I'm finding that so fascinating that the language is so loaded with these uh, acoustics, you know, and uh, yeah, and this is one of the things that I really would love at some point maybe to create some programs on the radio, a series of programs that we could discuss these things, because these are ideas that are becoming clearer to me, but they are not yet clear. <laughs> You know, so I think it would be great to have some programming where I'm talking to some people who are also interested in sound and, you know, I'm coming from this perspective and we can bring these ideas together and see how we can build some kind of language, you know, or maybe what language exists already out there for these it's really ideas. Very fascinating. Just today I read an article about listening, uh, listening cultures, and it was about, I think it was Ablinger and a composer, uh, and he was asked what he, hearing or listening is for him, and he said this is a perception before the perception. Like oh, wow. Exactly in a way what you said, that actually it is the it's to perceive in general is already conceived as this before then the perception of what we have to perceive from the world. Mm. I cannot translate it in, into English now, but I, I will find this out. And a lot of philosophers, French philosophers also argument with this, yeah. Uh, yeah. With this hearing as something more as a, as a introversial understanding of earth and, and your connection in the world right. more than, than a, a perception through the ears. Mm. Yeah, mm. So it's very interesting that in your language it is. Uh, so right. so how, how does salt sound in your language? Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's either it's too much or it's too little. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a very, very uh, fascinating, and I'm glad. Thank you for for asking that question, Laura. And of course, I want to add into this point that uh, about this radio source that you talked about. This is something, of course, that you can do also, like through the Bauhaus FM. That right now we are broadcasting, by the way, parallel with YouTube, right. and uh, you can make uh, reality shows. And because also it's radio, I would like to say that we still have five minutes for a, la a small last round of questions because maybe the time in YouTube is unlimited, but in radio it's still certain radio slots and we have to finish at nine. And Natalie, your microphone. I would have a question to my Simba as Vaima is listening and <laughs> the public of the gallery and we are all there. We would, I would like to know what can we prepare for you? What, what do you expect? What do you want to, who do you want to meet in Weimar? What do you, hope to find, uh, yeah, what, what do you are uh, interested in? So we can open a, a, already the horizon and maybe people outside uh, will come with ideas or 
connect to you. Thank you very much. So the first thing, I think I asked this before, uh, just find me some good coffee. <laughs> and uh, uh, most importantly, I, I, I'm thinking, I, I'm planning of working with, uh, uh, they don't have to be professional musicians, you know, uh, but uh, a few people who are interested in experimenting with sound at some point, maybe the last month of my residence when I, I'm performing, uh, I would love to do that. And maybe uh, a few dancers, uh, you know, if I could meet some people who are interested in uh, uh, experimenting, that would be, that would be amazing. I think it will be definitely possible. Thank of you. course, we have Corona, but yeah. Yes, yes, yes. People yes. from Weimar that also will also listen. They can also can be in contact into here in this city. Um, Laura, do you have a question? Um, speaking of questions, do you have any questions, Masinda, that you would like to ask us, or that you would like to know about the Radio Art Residence before you arrive here? Um. I've been talking to lecturers quite a lot, so I think I'm I'm getting a lot of information. Uh, so I'm I'm happy about that. And and uh, one of the most important questions was about coffee, and it was answered. So, and you have also <laughs> greetings from Eigenheim Gallery. Ah, so it uh, from the great. comments. Great, yes. great, great. I think we are all very much looking forward to you and uh, really to work and to experiment and invent and talk and discuss. And right. I want to thank also uh, ACC Gallery to make this evening happening and to invite us all. And yeah, also the listeners and Laura and Lefteris for the te technique and for the thank moderation you. and for this nice chat. <laughs> Great, thank you. And yeah, I'm looking forward to meet all of us in Weimar soon in the better circumstances for sure. <laughs> yes, thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you all for joining and the lovely insight also. Really looking forward to it. Um, thanks to all the cooperation partners as well. Um, and also until next time for the Monday night lectures of Azetse again at 8 o'clock. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>